Welcome back church, another week in our Speak Lord series. I hope it has been good for you so far. We are not just endeavoring to know how to hear God, but learning how to respond to the things that God asks of us. Today we're speaking about fighting with faithfulness, about the simple idea that as we live every day faithfully, God takes care of our future. So anyway, come on, let's go ahead and let's dive into this week's message. We are in uh, yet another series and uh, I love our series. I love that we give time for God to speak to us in themes. And we call those series. And uh, if you're joining us for the very first time, whether online or here in our services, welcome. It's good to have you here. We are definitely a a community kind of style church. uh, But what that means is that you can either watch from the outskirts or jump right in. Uh, I think we're really good at either meeting you or letting you walk out the foyer. So if like you're sprinting out the foyer, we kind of know. You don't want to talk to us. You know what I mean? You you know who you are. You're like somewhere up the back already running. Uh, (laughs) You're like this. I'll go. I'll leave the minute this is over. I'm out. We don't care where you're at. This is a place for you. And so anyway, welcome and online. Welcome wherever you are. Barcelona, welcome. You know, we've got two new team members, team members in Barcelona. That means four. We are, we are right there. Like we are, we are moving. It is going to happen. We started this with around six to eight people that were actually on team. A few others that were actually around in the service. But like, I think we're already doing well. So anyway, we're going to go into it. We are in our Speak Lord series. I want to draw our attention to our verse on this series Uh, I feel like it's a great focal point for us to remember what we are actually going for in this series. Let's go. Speak, Lord, if you could go to 1 Samuel for me. A third time the Lord called to Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Our whole goal in this series is that you and I would not just learn how to hear the voice of God, but that you and I would be comfortable with responding to the voice of God. I think that for many of us, we know how to hear God. In fact, we've heard Him at different seasons. The challenge as a Christian is, can you respond to the voice of God? When He calls you and it's not convenient, can you respond? Ananias yeah, in the New Testament, Paul, you've got Paul before he was Paul, he was Saul and Saul was a, he was a murderer. He, he had letters from the synagogue, from the head synagogue to go out, find Christians, bring them back, stone them to death for the fact that they were following Jesus. All of a sudden, he gets saved. And, uh, you know, Ananias is there somewhere else and God speaks to him. He says, Ananias, paraphrase, I need you. And I was like, whatever you need, God. And he's like, I need you to go speak to, to Saul. And he's like, whoa, hold on a second, okay. Uh, you mean the Saul that kills people? That has letters to kill people? Permission? Well, um, Uh, let's send someone else, but he goes anyway. And because one man was faithful inconveniently, another man was released into an incredible ministry calling that we are still shaped by today. The call of God is not always convenient, but it does need faithfulness. And that is our subject matter for this morning. We're gonna speak from the subject, fight with faithfulness. Fight with faithfulness faithfulness. I want to give you another verse and it's going to be our lens for today. We are in our series, but this is going to be our lens. If you could go over for me to John 3.30 for me. It goes this, it says this, the bridegroom belongs to the, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. It is speaking about John the Baptist as he was sitting there baptizing people and then Jesus comes along and now everyone's like, oh, hold on a second. Hey, you got competition. He's like, what do you mean I got competition? This is the exact person that I was making a way for. There is no competition. In fact, the moment he arrived on the scene, I needed to become less so that he could become more. We're gonna take a moment to pray before we get into this message. Are you ready? Come on, let's pray. Father God, I pray that you speak to us this morning. I pray that you fall on me in such a way, Lord God, that you would move me how you want to move me. Father God, I pray that beyond that, these words would cause you, Father God, to fall on people in this place and people listening in our digital community all the way around and that you might fall on them in such a way and move them as you want to move them. God, at the end of the day, we are standing here before you, both as a present community here in Chicago, another one in Toronto, Father God, and digital community spread out throughout the world. We have one intent, Lord God, this series, and it's that you would speak to us and that we would be able to say back to you, 
Your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, sometimes I feel like I should document my Uber rides because they're just, they're just, they're a blessing in disguise. You ever get into an Uber and you just get more than you, you know, you bargain for? I remember one, I mean, they, th- th- this woman had a decked out, she had little desks, fold out desks on the back of the seat. She had a whole thing of candy uh, just, just sitting there, which is always suspicious to me. I don't want to take people's candy that is free on offer in a public setting where all hands can be presently dipped. Something as a germaphobe concerns me at that moment. She was also a historian and she gave me tours of Chicago on this little thing. She told me a whole bunch of stuff. And she also was very, well, very, very, very well versed on the East Coast, West Coast rap feud of the 90s. <laughs> Tupac or Biggie, Tupac all day. Tupac all day. Now that I've grown past that, I can listen to both. When you're immature, you listen to one. But as you grow over time, you can embrace both Tupac and Biggie. Can I get an amen? So I'm in my Uber ride this week and he says this simple thing. And it, it just wrecked me because it was in line with what God was speaking to me about all week. We're sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone with someone. He goes, I hang up. He's like, are you, are you a, an addiction counselor? I'm like, uh, no, but kind of, depends on the day of the week. And he's like, because I am. I go, you know, uh, that's cool. We start talking. And at one point I said, well, I think we live in a day and age where everybody's addicted. It's just that some addictions control our life and are less acceptable by society. But the reality is we are addicted to affirmation. We are addicted to acceptance. We are addicted to whatever you wanna put it, social media. They're just the difference is that some addictions will ruin your life and others will just control it. And he says this to me. Well, we just live in a society with a construct that everybody needs more, 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 more. And nobody wants to be less than. And then he goes, but no one ever stops to ask themselves less than what? That (laughs) preached to me right there in the Uber because it's the truth. We often struggle with the construct of less than. In fact, the whole reason we often say yes to Jesus is because He is a supernatural option for more than. More than a conqueror more than what I currently am. But I don't often think we approach Jesus from the mentality that it's gonna require less than. In fact, the whole journey between you and I and God is a less than journey so that He could become more than. But I think we often basically live with a more than mentality. If I, I just need to be more. Jesus, you're here to make me more. You're here to give me more. You're here to bring me from more. You've, you just, he's a more God. But the only way He becomes more is when you and I become less. Not an easy construct, not a comfortable construct, because we want to be more. More well-known, more well-blessed. We want more. But God needs us in order to embrace the more. I call it kingdom economy. It's the stuff that doesn't make sense, but it makes sense to Jesus. In fact, He tells us that His way is foolishness to men. But the reality is it's wisdom in kingdom sight. It is exactly what we're meant to be. And in fact, I will go right now to Luke 4, if we will, because I think we see this construct just played out beautifully. And it is right before Jesus is gonna do everything that He's called to do, He goes through a less than series so that His Spirit might be more than and be who He's called to be. Let's read it quickly. It says this, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, ow. Left the Jordan, okay, that was cool. Uh, Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Isn't it a crazy concept that we would imagine that Jesus is at right now his weakest point? But the reality is Jesus is not at his weakest point. He's in fact at his spiritual strongest point. The physical, the flesh, the Bible says it. And if you've been a seasoned Christian, you you use that word often. (sighs) The flesh gets me every time. New people are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Vegans don't even come to church. Got no room for the flesh. Neither do we. We're on the same page. Flesh is that physical appetite for the things we want that contradict the things that God has. So Jesus goes through this whole time fasting, killing the flesh and 
giving strength and weight to the Spirit, so much so that the thing that might hinder him was so weakened that the thing that would make him was strong. I've learned this. There are things that you and I think we cannot live without. Until we live without them, we realize we don't need them to live. You ever notice that? Like as a kid, you're like, I could never live without my Legos. And then you get to like 15 and you're like, Legos, what? Like there's just this thing in our mind where before season, we can't imagine living without something. But the reality is, it's more a testament to our maturity, not what we need. And as we grow in our maturity, we realize this simple fact that there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't need to live with. In fact, when we live without it, we realize we can exist without it. And I think this, as you and I journey in this whole endeavor to know Jesus and be who He's called us to be, that all of a sudden we embrace this concept of living without and realizing that when we live without, we can actually live with the very thing that God wants for us. So I wanna give you three things that if you are gonna increase in the way that God has called you to increase, these things must decrease. We gotta make it clear, there is no room for all of you and all of Jesus. If you wanna be all that He called you to be, then something in you has gotta go. Something in you has gotta get left behind. Something in you has gotta die because He died and rose again that you might have life. But then if you're gonna have life, you gotta put some things to death. Some things have gotta go if you're gonna get what God has for you. Number one, the first thing that has to decrease if, God, if Christ will increase is your will. Your will. Your but I need it. Your but I want it. Your but I planned it. Your but I said it. Your but I was promised it. Your will must decrease if His will will increase. There actually is no room for both. There's only room for your will to be His will. I want what you want, Jesus. And you know what that requires? It requires education. Until you have, you know what education does? The presence of new information allows you to live to the level of what you know. If you know a God that is limiting, then all of a sudden you cannot trust that God. If you know a God that is restricting, you cannot trust that God. You won't go with that God. But if you realise that by putting Him first and putting yourself last, that all of a sudden things start to move in your life. Now it is easy to live with less because you realise that the less of you is the more of Him. I think we've all lived in seasons with more of us and the more of us leaves us bankrupt. I had a will to do all the sorts of things that I needed to do. I used to tell my grow group leader, dude, I'm going clubbing because I just love dancing. It's not about the girls, man. I just gotta move. These Latin hips don't lie, I gotta dance. It's funny that as I grew up, I started realizing I wasn't really going to dance. I was just looking for girls because I was lonely because I came from a broken family. And the greatest thing I wanted was family because it was my only way of redeeming that which was taken from me. My will will redeem it in my way. God's will redeem it in the way that will actually be sustainable. If you're gonna get more of God, you gotta lose more of you. If you're gonna get what God has for you, you gotta realise that your will is your way of completing your desires. But the Bible tells us that He knows the desires that He's placed in you and that He is good and faithful to bring them. And the good thing is that when God brings the desires, He brings them well. Have you ever noticed that? If, the other day we were joking in one of my small groups and we we're like, man, I wish God just answered prayers automatically. Do you know how big my return line would be? You ever gone shopping and just on the spur of the moment, you're like, I'm getting it. And you come out and you got like a yellow, like feather coat. People are like, I don't know, it, just, it was good in the moment. Could you imagine the things I've prayed for? I probably have a lion somewhere. I have a lion, a Harley. I have all sorts of things. Things I don't even want, will never use. I have to take them back. I probably wouldn't have been married to Audrey. I probably wouldn't be in Chicago. I probably wouldn't have seen the breakthrough I've seen. In fact, I would be a very weak version of myself because if I got everything when I wanted it, I would have never had to fight for it and I never would have become the bigger person in Christ because I got it in Chris. Thank God He makes us wait. Thank God that He is sovereign. If you want His will to increase in your life, take a stock take this week and see what you will decrease. And then learn from the principle. Watch how as you decrease, He'll increase. Watch what His increase looks like and how long it lasts. If God's gonna increase. 
the first thing that's got to go is your will. Your will must decrease so that God's may increase. Number two, what is in your hands? What is, your hand must decrease so that His can increase. The things that you control in life have got to go so that He can take control of the things that He needs to steer. When I'm in control, I steer things in the wrong direction. When He's in control, He steers them towards kingdom. Kingdom is the greatest direction because I was made for a purpose. All of every, every single one of us were made with a purpose. And our purpose is to bring people to Jesus and Jesus to people. When I'm in control, when my hand's on it, I don't always steer it to that direction. When His hand is on it, everything that is in me starts moving towards everything that is in Him. I love that Jesus says He could only do what He saw the Father do. My life needs to be more of looking to the Father as a model of what I'm gonna do. Not looking to my desires as a model of what I wanna do. Not looking in my Instagram account for what other pastors are doing for what I'm gonna do. If God's gonna increase, my hand must decrease. The things that I control must go to the back burner and the things that God needs to control. He needs to control my destiny. He needs to control my relationships. He needs to control my forgiveness. Because if I'm the greatest anchor in my life, then my anchor is flawed. But if Christ is my anchor, that's an anchor. That's what brings me going. That's what brings me to everything. And the third one is this. If God is going to increase, my will must decrease. My hand must decrease. And I must decrease as a whole. Who I am, the construct, my identity, cannot be so forged and formed on who I need to be, but who Christ says I am. Crazy little revelation before we get into this next portion. You know what's crazy is like, I was, I was reading a very well-known verse where Jesus looks at Peter and he says, hey, who do you say that I am? Peter says, I say that you are the Son of God, the Messiah. And he goes, this is the thing. Straight away, then Jesus says to him, well, I tell you. G Peter's identity is released when Jesus is revealed. You can't know who you are or you don't even give him a chance to speak into who you are until you first accept who he is. If you don't accept who, he's, who he is, his words carry no weight. It is through our acceptance that Jesus is Christ, that he is who he says he is, that all of a sudden allows him the platform to speak into who we are. And by speaking into who we are, he takes care of who we're not. Jesus must increase and Chris must decrease. I got to go. Let's stop saying, I'm the kind of guy that, I'm the kind of girl that I've always been. I don't care about who I've always been because who I've always been is not who I'm always meant to be. Who I'm meant to be is who Jesus says I am and let Jesus be the ruler of my life, not the labels that I came from, not society, not what people say, not my perceptions, not my hurts. You know that I walked into a church years and years and years ago that was mainly like, Josh and Kelly looking Australian, which in Australia, you wouldn't even realize this, but there is a racial dynamic. I have been pulled out of lines. I've been told in nightclubs, people like you can't be here tonight because we had problems with people like you. There's words for people like me, wog. That's what I'm called. I've had families outside of the neighborhood chant and spit at me because of the way I look. That's my life. It lives outside of this country, but don't ever be thinking that prejudice is only in this country. I've been spat on, I've been suspended, I've been expelled, all sorts of things because of the way I look. I've been told that people like me are vindictive. How do you know what? <laughs> well, people that look like you. Where am I from? The teacher couldn't answer. That's just what it is. So I walked into a church that looked predominantly like this. <sighs> Insecurity rose. I hate everyone. I hate you because I think you hate me. And then Jesus became real to me. And Jesus started to tell me, Chris, don't let a nation define you. He asked me one simple question. Chris, if you play soccer for a nation, who will it be? Will it be Uruguay? No, it'll be Australia. Well, then change Australia. And Australia changes when I don't actually increase the negativity that is being increased towards me. But when I decrease in my insecurity and Christ increases my security, I start becoming an agent of change in the nation that God has called me. Can I tell you, we have prejudice problems in this nation, but in the church, we must be solid. There must be a, a picture of solidarity that we will rise above and be who we're called to be. We cannot ignore it, but we can be a solution. I got to decrease if he's going to increase. Let me tell you about where we are as a church and the vision of our church. I've been promising you for weeks that I'm gonna tell you about where we're going, where we are, and the state of where we, are, where we are. So I believe this. Our vision is massive. Our vision is huge and our vision is inconvenient. 
But I believe this, that God is gonna bring people and has brought people to this church with such big visions that they realize this simple fact that the bigger the vision, the less of you that could exist in it. The bigger the vision that comes with personal sacrifice, every great person that has done something big, whether for God or not, has had to decrease so that that vision could increase. Well, we as kingdom people are the very same thing. You know, the only way to build a great church is by selflessness. I'm aware this might not be your absolute preference, but I hope you never pick this church on stylistic preference. I pray you pick this church on what God is doing on this church, the hand that He's gone on this church, the vision that is on this church. You should never just sign up for someone for who they are alone, but who they're called to be. So we have a vision. We have a vision that requires us to decrease. And for that vision, I need this. Who's got the first person to come up? Come on up. See, part of our vision is this. We've got a digital community. It doesn't sound real. It doesn't sound like it's a real thing because it's digital. They're just electronic people, but they're not. On the other side of those electronics, do you know that we get anywhere between 20 to 40,000 downloads of our podcast every single month? We have over, I'd say maybe, geez, we'd have to be around 35,000 in our social media following people that inbox us and tell us that they are just getting moved by what God is doing. Do you know that that actually has come from right here? Right here, what is happening here? Something about it, God is doing. I wanna kind of tie this together in a minute. So our digital community made a way for Renee. Where's Renee? Over there, over there. Renee, Renee might seem simple and small and a church just little kind of way for you to connect. But you know that the number one problem that churches have around the world is they do not know how to connect people from their seats to the call of God. This is not tech for the sake of tech. This is a way to address the way that people communicate in our day and age and help them in the most secure, non-pressuring way, get to their best day through what we already use every day. We can't go without doing this. So let's put purpose in front of this. Right there, Renee streams. Stand a little bit back. You're a stream. Yeah, you're right there. Then we've got right here, we've got... Hundreds of thousands of people that could be impacted by this one stream, by our digital community, by our marketing, our branding. You know that every time we put out something there that is aesthetically pleasing enough for people to stop and look at it, it causes them to stop and read it. When they read it, they read about a God who loves them, not about a church that is cool or a church that has great aesthetics. It's not about that. We have aesthetics to bring people in so that God can elevate them and bring them up. Then all of a sudden we've got, quicker, Go over this way. Advocacy. Our idea is that the church cannot enjoy its comfort while ignoring other people's discomfort. That we would take not-for-profits and that we would use business models with a 100% model that 100% of proceeds after paying costs would go towards advocacy. That there are developing communities in our city that don't have all the potential that they should have because they don't have the options that they should have. Because options are rare. Schools only shut down in the neighbourhoods that need them most. We need to do something about it because we are the church and advocacy makes a way for this stuff. So what if, what if through Renee and what we've done, through our faithfulness, fighting faithfully, what if all of a sudden we created a school of arts and a tech school that lived on the South and the West side that everybody in our nation wanted to come to, that in the midst of a nation where some people were too afraid to walk through, we would make it a place to get to. That we would do something in this place. Now, out of advocacy lives micro enterprise. Well, we'll just go love is. Where's love is? Where's our micro? Okay, come love is. Where's he gonna come? Quickly, run, run, run. We don't have time. You gotta get fit. You gotta run. You gotta go. Let's go. Okay. Love is. Love is our endeavor. We say this. Love is not a thought. It's, an, it's a love-filled action. I, you know, we often think it's a thought that counts. You know what? No broken person benefits by your thoughts of them. No starving child benefits from your thoughts of them. No school will be built by the thought of it. But love is an action, a love-filled action. When we do love is, all of a sudden we've got global serve days around the world. When we do love is, we've got micro enterprise. Micro enterprise where we go to developing communities around the world and in this nation, we believe in them enough to give them a $5,000 loan. Say, start your business while we train you. Because when you start a business, you employ people from your, your place. You employ people from your city. Now people who look like you start doing big things and we start sending a message that there's not just one option. There's not just one way out. You are worth believing in. You are worth investing in. You are worth taking a risk on. 
Because you're more than what the world has told you you are. You're more than those that have gone before you have said you are. You are great. You will change this world. Next thing you know, that brings sustainable change. You guys stay there. Sustainable change. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Shh. <laughs> We've got a mother that right now, ready to go. We could put through this. Sustainable change. Change that is not me putting food on your table. We gotta stop giving people a handout. Handout is the easy solution. Hand up takes personal investment. <laughs> Means my schedule must decrease so that their opportunity might increase. Then that means that we've got the opportunity to do Barcelona, Tokyo, and New York. We held a grow group in New York and we were surprised by the outcome. More people showed up to grow group than the launch of this church. Here's what I wanna tell you. Let me show you this. Bring up the first slide. I promise you I'd show you where we're at financially because I have no reason to hide it because we've built faithfully. We've built with good stewardship. You don't see me driving a Ferrari. We haven't staffed Audrey and I so heavily that the vision of the church was choked. We've done nothing, I believe, for anybody to not sow into this place. In fact, right here, this will live on our website. And the only reason it doesn't is because we don't have enough staff to put it on there. Because that takes hours of somebody coding it and putting it into a page. I know, ridiculous. But feeding people means it's got logistics like cleaning plates, scooping out food, ushering people through doors. That doesn't happen because we will it. It happens because we sow into it. it. Says this, weekend events, 8%, outreach, operations, buildings, personnel, 40% of our budget. That's where it goes. All up, we have a net income monthly, what well, we did of 75,000. That's typically our, our monthly average at the moment. But you can see there, of 75,000, we've got six staff. Of 75,000, we have two buildings. Of 75,000, we still do random acts of kindness, like actually helping people and giving gifts of thousands and helping when there's, a ter when there's like, I don't know if there's a, uh, there was hurricanes and things like that. We've always sown into it. If somebody comes to our doorstep and can't pay their bills, we've paid for bills. We've helped people get fully clothed when they've come in homeless and broken because Jesus says, if you remember, just as you've done to them, you've done to me. This is the church that you're in. This is what people are sowing into. Go over to the slide that tells you. That's the allocation, 15% ministries, 10%, you know, personal, personnel, 40%, building, 35%. We pay around $26,000 for two buildings a month. And we use them for about eight hours. Next slide. We've got about 1,200 people, 1,300 people that call people church home. Over all services, over a week, and they call it home. They come through this building, 1,300 people, which is awesome. How cool is that? We started with like 20. Awesome. Out of, 100, out of 1,300 people, that's 164 givers, which means 13% of our church gives. 13% of our church has decreased so that Christ would increase in practical ways. But this is what it could look like. This is actually current giving. Now go to the next slide. So our current giving gives us 160 givers at 57,000 a month. That's what we did last month. We decreased, but that's just an off month. That doesn't always happen like that. I wanna tell you, we steward so well that what I'm telling you is not so we could operate. You'll never get us coming up here and saying, if you don't give, we'll close the doors because we just don't lead beyond our provision. But that's the thing. This right here, we've got it covered. Doors, staff, but this is what it does. We get six staff, two buildings, occasional generosity, maintenance of just this whole thing, coffee, cables, all that kind of stuff. And then we do Sunday experience and all that kind of stuff happens out of that as well. Now, if we went to 20% giving, next slide, that would give us 240 givers at $86,000 a month. That would give us 10 staff, we need 14 this year. 10 staff, two buildings, occasional generosity, maintenance, Sunday experience, Renee, would happen. You know, Renee is going to be given to every church under a thousand for free. Because if we can help them break a thousand, that is a moment of momentum that they could keep going. Every church over a thousand will pay for it. Every church under a thousand will give for free. We designed it that way because we want to give kingdom something. Four micro enterprise opportunities. Four people would start their dream. 
four people, if those four people just employed 10 people out of that, we'd have 40 people that have now been impacted. Those 40 people each come from families. Now we're up in the hundreds of people that have seen sustainable change happen in their lifetime in a time where people walk, drive through their neighbourhood with fear, not with faith. The next one, we could go to 40% giving. If 40% of our church gave, we would have 10 staff, two buildings, occasional generosity, maintenance, Sunday experience, Renee, four micro enterprise opportunities, Barcelona, church online to go live streaming. We've got to spend 30, about 40,000, 38,000 something. Youth, because when you get to a youth, you don't just save a life, you save a lifetime. There's a difference. Love is, we could literally show the love of Jesus because the love of Jesus came with sacrifice. At 60% givers, we would have 14 staff, two buildings, occasional generosity, maintenance, Sunday experiences, Renee, four micro enterprise opportunities, Barcelona, church online, youth, love is, and the purchase of our very own building. What we pay now is almost enough for us to sustain the loan that we need. You know that in every building we've gone to, we've had the money to do it. In some, like just to just scrape in and get there. Do you know that people have shut us down because we're a church? Because other businesses have had more. So because of their more, we can't compete with them. That the city doesn't want us in most places. So we have to buy something outright because they don't want us. The church today has become a pain because we've lost sight of our purpose. Let me tell you this so you know where we're at right now. Do you know that none of this is hinged on anything other than us? Right here, everything here exists. God has brought us the influence of our digital community, which is why New York is on the radar and Barcelona as well. God brought that. We didn't do it. I mean, I'm clear. I'm not a great leader. It's Jesus. I know that. I never want to get here and take the place of what He has done. Jesus has done it. It's there for the taking. Right, right there, hundreds and thousands right there. We could just go, we could just go. We could do digital streaming, we go. We could do, we could do New York, we could do Barcelona. You know, George and Leslie, we've been planning this. They already have everything they need. They know their visas, they know their venues, they know what we're doing. We are good. We're not a flippant church. We don't just say things. Don't mistake our passion for a lack of planning or faithfulness. That is ready to go. Renee, right here, we have an engineer that would be worth 140,000 in any market, but he works for us for not even half of that. We've got at least three other engineers in this building that we could put on staff tomorrow and Renee would go to market in only about three months from now. Churches around the world impacted, right there. This school and advocacy, Southside, Westside, is actually linked to our micro enterprise. Do you know that Erica, I spoke this vision four years ago. She was faithful enough not to tell me anything, but to go back and get her master's in this same subject so that she might do it. She graduated last year, ready to go, but all she needs, we need to staff her. I'm telling you, I'm saying humbly that I've done my best, sacrificed my most. Over the years, over seven years, I've done the most I possibly could. I didn't love Chicago, I loved Australia, but something in me has got to decrease if he's going to increase. We have done our best. God has shown up. He's influenced for us. He has brought, we've prayed for workers and the workers are here and they're sitting here, but someone's got to send them because if they are not sent, how will they know? How will they hear? All this, you know, it's not hinged on anything else. I think sometimes we have a mentality, oh, God's gonna show up. God's shown up. But you know what we need to do? We need to show up too. Called the only thing that's waiting is you. You. Your generosity. Your tithe might be $30 a week. It might seem insignificant, but it might be the one that takes us from 239 givers to 240 givers. You are a generous church. You do random acts of generosity. Every now and then we'll get a check of 18,000, 10,000. It's just impossible to budget off generosity like that because we don't know when it's coming next. You and me, if you and me did what we're saying here, if, if 60% of our church gave, Barcelona would be sent. We wanted to send them in August because we want to give them a run up. That would be, they'd be there. They still could be there. And I say this, I've got to go. we got to go. I've got to go. See, peace. I say this because I don't know how else to do it. I don't know how else to be in front of you as your pastor and leader and tell you 
that I think we've done a good job. We could do better, but I think we've done a good job. And if you will come to the table, this vision is not what will be accomplished in five years from now. That's the beauty of this. I know when I said it, Vision Sunday, everyone's like, that's crazy. It's now. Because we've been speaking it since day one. If you would come to the table, all this will happen this year. So I just wanted to put it out there. I'm not asking for anything other than your faithfulness. We're going to fight. We're going to fight that the church has lost its reputation. It's not the world's fault. It's ours. But we're going to fight to get it back. We're going to fight for that single mother. We're going to fight for the opportunities in the south and the west side. We're going to fight for neighbours and, 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 and cities around the world. We're going to fight for Barcelona. We're going to fight for Tokyo. And we're going to fight with faithfulness. We're just going to do what God says to do. He doesn't say give it all. He just says give me that portion that I've asked for and I'll bless it and I'll do something with it. We could change the world. We could do this this year. And I, I'll make you this promise, church. I'll make you this promise. I will lead with my utmost best to make sure that at the end of the year we celebrate. But I want you to know if it doesn't happen, we're not a church that just says things that don't happen. We're a church that says things and we need you to come to the table with them. If you will do it, we will do it. It's waiting. They're ready. The people are ready to go. I pray that we would fight with faithfulness. If that speaks to you, can we just give God a shout of praise this morning? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Can we pray? Father, we just, we pray, Lord. Your Word tells us, Lord God, that You would move on our hearts and that each of us should give as You've called us to, as You've put on our heart to. Holy Spirit, we ask that You speak, Lord, because Your servants are listening. We're willing and ready to fight with faithfulness. And we thank You for the vision You've given us. And we thank you that you call and cause and even pause it until we participate. Father, I believe that the next few years of this church are bright. And I pray for the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that will be impacted by it. We thank you, Jesus. Well, I hope today spoke to you and challenged you like it did me. It really has been a theme of less of me, more of God. I think we can all embrace that. And if you're in our digital church and we might not be in your city just yet, you might be able to make some room by less of you and more of what God can do. And He might be able to utilize you to help us get to you in the near future. Anyway, I hope this spoke to you. I want to encourage you, if this is your church digitally, then why don't you go ahead and be part of it by building it with your giving. And if you are new, follow us on our social media handles, People Church on Instagram, or you could just tag this video below, hit subscribe and follow along with us there. Hey, keep letting us know what's happening in your life. Let us know if we could pray for you about anything. We love you. We thank you for everything that you're a part of. Let's keep building together. Have a great week.